the honesty moment here with you. They've always judged preachers who brought water to the podium as if they thought they were something, and I find myself bringing water <laughs> to the podium this morning, so uh, it's going to be okay, right? Um, we're going to take a, a little bit of a uh, continued detour uh, from uh, Matthew chapter 6 this morning uh, because this next section of, of Matthew chapter 6, I think in order for us to truly wrap our mind around it, we have to take a little bit of time and look at the person of the Holy Spirit and what God intends for our heart and our life to look like. Uh, the next section in Matthew, uh, Jesus makes it very clear, you can't serve two masters. Can't do it. So what does that mean for your life? What does that mean that your, what should your heart look like? If you turn with me uh, to the book of John, um, <coughs> we're going to start in chapter 7. And uh, before we begin, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father, uh, we thank you for sending your Son to pay the price of our sin. And Father, we thank you for sending us your Comforter and the Holy Spirit. And we thank you that you guide and direct our hearts and our lives if we will allow you through the power of your spirit. And Father, I pray that we would submit ourselves to him. Allow him to rule and to control us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as we uh, pick up here in, in uh, John chapter 7, uh, Jesus is um, most likely he is at uh, the Passover here. Uh, he is at the, the great feast is what it is called. Um, just before this, he has uh, spoke to uh, those that were following him and he told them that uh, the time was going to come that they would have to eat his flesh. And some of the people were a little uh, freaked out over that and so they quit following him. And Jesus, he's here at this, at this Passover, and he begins to teach the crowd. Many have chosen to not follow him. On the other hand, there's many who are asking, um, is this the Christ? Um, in fact, if you'll skip up to verse 25, I didn't give this to Brock, but I'm just kind of thinking here. Verse 25, he says, Then said some of them of Jerusalem, is not this he who they seek to kill? The Pharisees, uh, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, the chief priest, they wanted to kill Jesus. The people that are there, they said, isn't, isn't this the man that, that they are seeking to kill? In verse 26, but lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Like they ask this question, they're like, hey, um, I thought they wanted to kill this guy, and now he's up, and he's speaking, and he's teaching, and nobody's saying anything to him. Like, do they know, that, do they know something we don't know? Do they know that he's, he's the Christ? And so people are they're beginning to ask these, these questions, you know, what's, what's going on here? Oh, we don't understand. You say you want to kill him, but you're, you're, not, you're not killing him. Verse 28 then cried Jesus in the temple, and he taught, saying, You both know me, and you know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not, but I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Jesus says, You don't know the one I'm from, but I do. He sent me, and he's standing here, and he's saying that he is from God. And people are beginning to, to listen to him, and, and they're, they're asking these questions. And then in verse 36, something beautiful uh, is said. Not that it's not all beautiful, but this is very straight to the point. 
uh, John chapter 7, verse 36, he says, uh, What manner of saying is this that he said, You shall seek me and shall not find me. Whether I am, thither you cannot come. But in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me and the scripture hath said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Jesus, as he's standing there and he's speaking to this crowd in this unbelievably loud voice, apparently, he explains to them that he is from God. He's bringing the message of God. And if you want God, if you're going to thirst for him, you got to ask for this living water. The same thing that uh, Jesus told Nicodemus. He said, unless you have been born of water and of the Spirit, you can't enter into the kingdom. Born of water, meaning like the natural human birth, and born of the Spirit. Just being born isn't enough to be right with God. It requires a spiritual birth. There's something that scares me. It keeps me up at night at times thinking about the church and how little influence that we allow the Spirit to have on our lives. The Spirit of God is the seal of your salvation. Jesus says, if you want to know God, if you thirst for Him and you ask, then He will give you these living waters and they're, He says they'll overflow. He'll give you a new life. I believe there's a couple different types of, of people. Uh, we're going to look at three this morning. One would be the person who is uh, dead set on, I have been born of water, I am alive, and I can make it on my own. You're depending on yourself, you're depending on some type of experience that you've had, some type of tradition that you've had, some type of, of religion that a family member of yours may have had. Best illustration that I, I can think of, is, of this is uh, when I had the opportunity uh, to go to Israel, I, I think I was like 18 years old at that point. I had just been saved for a, a couple of years and I remember uh, going to some of these uh, holy sites. One of them that, that really stuck out to me was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is where uh, the uh, Roman Catholic Church says that Jesus died and was buried. It is not the correct place. Hebrews chapter 13 tells us that he suffered outside the gate. And this place is inside the city gate. But I digress. So we walk into this place, and it's just it's part of our tour. You know, you're going through, you visit all these places, and our tour guide, he would tell us, well, well this place has some historic authenticity, and this place is just tradition. And, but we walked in, and there were... There's this little place there, a little uh, room. The floor was laid with stone, all these neat uh, windows and candles. It was just a crazy looking place. And uh, these men came out and they had these, uh, these like lantern type things where they were burning incense. They come out and they're, they're swinging them and they're, they're chanting uh, these words I, I couldn't understand. 
And as soon as they were done, the, the next denomination of people, they, they came in and, and they did something similar, but with their own little, their own little twist. And, and I, I watched the people that, are, that were walking through, and people were standing there almost worshiping this, this act that was going on. And as we made our way through this, this, this church, there was a cross there, and they said, this is where Jesus was crucified. And there was like this mad crowd of people trying to crawl their way up there to, to touch this cross and to light a candle and, and to kiss it. And I remember sitting there, or staying there and watching this, and my heart just hurt. And down underneath of this little, <clears throat> this little altar type thing that was there was what they claimed to be uh, the tomb of, of Jesus, which was actually dug by a, a Muslim man a thousand years ago, but it's at the, they think it's at the right place. So there were people that were fighting to get into this tomb, to, to look in there and to have some type of experience. They're kissing the wall. For those of you that are saved and you're sitting here this morning, you're like, that's, that's, that's nuts. Yes, it is. But the reality is, the majority of people who call themselves followers of Christ call themselves that because of some type of tradition, some type of experience, some type of, of something that has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit being the seal of of your salvation. Remember as we left there, we walked down, uh, it's called the, the Videl Rosa. Most likely it's, the, it's the, the road that Jesus would have walked on as he uh, walked out to uh, Golgotha or to Calvary. Remember walking up and seeing this, this rock there that you could look at and you could kind of make out the the face of a skull, if you looked at it, which is what the scripture talks about. You know, he's crucified at the place of the skull. And then there's a garden there that has a tomb in it. And our tour guide was explaining, you know, this, this, kind, this, this really fits most of the descriptions and the parameters. And it's very possible that this is the actual tomb of Jesus. And I remember looking at that and, and thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. But here's the thing. I do not believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried for three days, and rose again from the dead because of some type of thing that I have seen. I don't believe it because I had some type of experience in, the, in, this, in this world. I don't believe it because I saw a rock that looks like it has the face of a skull on it. I believe it because the Holy Spirit has made that clear to me. I remember as we were sitting there in the, in the garden. And I'm not going to lie, it's pretty cool just to sit there and think this could be where it happened. But this wasn't the end. And we sat there and we had, we had communion. I, and I was, I was sitting there and I'm thinking, I, so many people make this trip so they can worship these sites. But they're missing it. My greatest fear is there may be one of you here this morning you've checked all the boxes maybe you're even a quote unquote official church member but the Holy Spirit does not dwell inside of you Romans chapter 8 verses 9 through 11 Romans chapter 8, starting verse 9, he says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. 
If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you do not have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you do not belong to God. You see, Jesus promised his disciples that, that he was going to send the Comforter in uh, uh, John chapter 16, <clears throat> you can turn there if you want. In John chapter 16, 16 starting uh, verse 1, it says, In these things I spoken to you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And these things <clears throat> will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you. That when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you, but now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you ask me whether goest thou. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell, the truth, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. It's so easy to, to stop the, uh, the Easter train of thought after Easter morning and Resurrection Day. But Resurrection Day just sets something in order that's going to happen in 50 days later that's going to change the world. It's going to change your life. Jesus told his disciples, he says, I have to leave you. They've spent three and a half years walking with him. Him teaching them, him instructing them, saying, do this, do that. This is what the heart of God is. This is what the law teaches, and this is what God actually wants you to do. This is how you love God. This is how you serve others. And Jesus is standing there talking to his disciples, and he says, it's expedient that I have to go. He said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, though. He says, your heart's hurt because I tell you this. They didn't want this to happen. But this sets a chain of events in order that changes their hearts. You see, Jesus raises from the dead... He spends 40 days going about and meeting with his disciples and other people. Then he ascends into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God. He tells his disciples, he says, go to Jerusalem and wait. Go to Jerusalem and wait. Something exciting is going to happen. So they do. They go to Jerusalem and they're waiting and they're waiting. What's God going to do? What's this going to look like? Then it happens. Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover, it's in Acts chapter 2. The work of the Holy Spirit is poured out on them. And they are forever changed. As I look around this room, I see some of you. I know your stories. I see the greatest miracle that has ever happened. I'm not trying to embarrass anyone, but I, I look at at Ron and, and Georgia Ricketts. 
and their story of who they were before they came to know Christ, before God moved into their heart. And I have to say that only God can change a heart of stone. Look out at Kim. You listen to her story of where she was and where God brought her from, not because of some experience that she had, but because God moved inside of her, brought her to life. You can't fake that. I look back in the sound room and I see Carl sitting back there with his little headset on. A man who didn't even believe that God existed. God spoke to him. Worked a miracle in his heart. He saved him. Moved into him. He changed his life. The Holy Spirit doesn't live inside of you and he's not doing his work. You do not know God. I look at my own life. I was convinced that I go to church, have a Christian family. I'm good when I need to be good. I do what I want when I want. It's good enough. But when God moved in my heart, everything changed. I was a dead man. And he brought me to life. He quickened me through his spirit. My question to some of you this morning is your faith based on where you've been or what you've done? Or is your faith based on the fact that God lives inside of you? If it's anything else, you're misguided. The Holy Spirit is not a, it's not a power for you to harness and to command. The Holy Spirit is... He is God. He lives inside of you. Romans chapter 8, verse 27. You can turn there if you want. Actually, I'm going to start in verse 26. It said, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. He says here, sometimes, in fact, most of the time, you don't even know what to pray. But the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of you, he knows the heart of God. When you pray wrong, he makes it right. He makes petition on your behalf. He speaks for you. He knows what you really need. You see, so often we live our lives uh, determined to get what we want. We pray for what we think we know we need, but the Holy Spirit, He knows what you need. Whether it is in your darkest hour, 
in the deepest of valleys or whether it is the time that you feel spiritually you are absolutely on the top of the mountain, God who lives inside of you knows you intimately and he makes intercession on your behalf. And when that happens, your life looks different. Galatians chapter 5 paints a picture for us of what that life should look like. You can turn there with me if you want. Galatians chapter 5, start in verse 20. You see, Paul lays out here what the works of the flesh are. We we'll start in verse 19. He said, But the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, violence, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murder, drunkenness, reviling, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in the past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because that's not the fruit of the Spirit that lives inside of you. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such thing there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions and lust. And if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I said before, I believe there's three types of people in here this morning. I believe there's some of you in here that you are a Christian by your very works and deeds, but in your heart, God does not live inside of you and you do not really know him. And if that's you, I would beg you this morning, say, God, come into me. I surrender to you. There's some of you in here this morning, though, I believe that you do strive to live by the Spirit. And this list of sins that, that Paul lays out here in Galatians, they aren't what characterizes you. Your life is characterized by the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering. And he goes on down the list and he says, against what such things there is no law. You have complete freedom in these things. There are some of you in here this morning, you live in spiritual freedom because you recognize that the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to be at peace with God regardless of the situation. You should be at peace with God when you are having a general conversation with a co-worker, you should be at peace with God if you find yourself in the situation that Stephen found himself preaching <coughs> excuse me, the gospel, standing before a mob of people with rocks in their hands. The Holy Spirit gave him peace. Your situation does not matter. Let's say it again. Your situation does not matter. You say, well, you don't know what I'm going through right now. I'll say it again. Your situation does not matter. Amen. If you are in the lowest, darkest place of your life, the Holy Spirit still administers His fruit, peace, love, joy. If you are on top of the world, 
peace, love, joy, go on down the list, they should still be the thing that characterizes you. God has promised you peace that passes all understanding. It's the peace that a family experiences when they're there watching their loved one on their deathbed and there's a peace in the room that it, it will be okay. And that individual, when they're laying there on that deathbed, they say, it's going to be okay. The world doesn't understand that, but that's the peace that God gives you. It is the fruit of His Holy Spirit that He's placed inside of you. You should be characterized by patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These Things should characterize you. And like I said, I believe there's some of you in this room. You rely on that peace. It is what keeps you going from one day to the next. Your everything depends upon it. But there's one more group that's in here this morning. There is a group of you in here. You've given your heart to God. You've placed your faith in Jesus Christ. But you've failed to understand the reality that the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, He is a person who has genuine feelings and genuine emotions, and you have set Him off to the side because He calling you to something different than you want in your life right now. Ephesians chapter 4. Paul in his exhortation, in his letter, the church of Ephesus, he writes this. Verse 29 it says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. He's like the very words that you speak, everything that comes out of your mouth, it should be a reflection of that love, joy, peace, long-suffering. That is what is to characterize you then he makes this statement in verse 30. He says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. He says, Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. A lot of times when I'm talking with kids, I... Uh, I explain it like this. Um, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, and a great picture of that is a receipt. Uh, how many of you spent ample time in Walmart? <laughs> yeah, all right. So they know me by name, a lot of them. But the other night I went in, it was super early in the morning. I don't even know why I was there. It was like 3 in the morning. And uh, there's this guy that was there, and he was, he was you know, security guard. Had his little hat on, Vietnam veteran, and you know, I'm like this guy, he he may be pretty tough. I don't want to mess with him. And so I walk in, and I just kind of wave at him, and he just kind of gives me a look. And on the way out, I went by the cell rack, and I had bought some stuff that was too big to put into a bag. And, and so on the way out. He says, hey, can I, can I see your receipt? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I hand it to him. I purchased my items. The proof that I purchased my items was my receipt. 
He looked at me and he said, you wouldn't believe the things that people try to bring out of here without the receipt. He said, I had a guy try to carry a TV out. Another guy tried to carry out a set of tires. He said, they didn't have the receipt. The Holy Spirit is your receipt. You're either going to let him control your life or you're not. You're going to let him be the mark on your life or you're not. You want to know what it means to be a Christian. You will never find it exploring the things that this world has to offer you. You want that peace, love, joy, You'll never have it surfing pornography. You want that peace, love, joy, contentment. You'll never have it if your life is characterized by you being a jerk to your spouse. You want your life to be filled with peace, love, joy, long-suffering. It'll never happen when, you're, when you hate your neighbor. It'll never happen when you lust and desire to have things that aren't yours. When you covet your neighbor's stuff. It'll never happen when you look for it anywhere else except through the power of God. A lot of people out there call themselves followers of Christ. But the truth is, their lives, your lives, our lives, many times are characterized by things that have no place in God's kingdom. Where are you at? You're in one of the three. Either you do not know God and His Spirit does not live inside of you, or you, ha you know Him and you've surrendered to Him and you are saying, God, I want to live through Your power. I want Your fruit to just exude from my life. And there's some of you here this morning that you say, I am saved but I have quenched the Spirit of God. He is set off in a corner, and I will do whatever I want to because I know I'm good. If that's you, you're a miserable, miserable person. Where's your heart? Ask Kelly if she would to come and to get us a, a song. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. He tells us that the Holy Spirit is an imperishable seed. We're to be born again. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. What type of seed characterizes your life? Is it what the world has to offer you? Or is it what God offers you in the person of His Holy Spirit? I ask you all if you would to bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to just take a moment with God. Where am I at? Do you live inside of me? Remember what Peter told them at Pentecost. He said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ and receive the Holy Spirit. Have you done that? Does he guide you? Direct you? Do you seek his guidance? Or are you in the boat where You'd say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. I know if I died right now, 
I would spend eternity in heaven with God, but my life is my life. Maybe you need to repent of that. Jesus told Peter, he explained to them, him that Satan was going to, to tempt him and that he had prayed for him that his faith wouldn't fail. And he tells him, he says, when you're converted, he said, I want you to go and I want you to help out your brothers. He's like, you're going to drift for a little while, but when you come back, I want you to be something that you've never been before. Maybe God's knocking on the door of your heart right now and he's saying, come back. Let me control you. Be not filled with wine, which is in excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, he says, don't let alcohol control you, but in the same way that alcohol would control you, let God control you through His Spirit. Will you let Him do that? Father, we thank You for this day. We thank You for Your love and Your mercy that You've given to us. Father, we thank You that You did not leave us comfortless after Jesus died on the cross rose again and ascended into heaven, but you sent your comforter who teaches us how to live. He guides us into all truth. He makes us as close to the image of God or your image as it's humanly possible, bringing us from one degree to another. Father, we trust you. We trust that you be glorified in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.